I, in my junior year at BU, 51, 52, I was a member of a loosely configured group called the Poetry Club. We met in people's apartments in and around Beacon Hill on certain evenings, drank beer, read poetry, unpublished and published, and including members reading their own stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in a very informal election, I was elected vice president. How many people were in the club? Oh, 20. We were not sanctioned by the university. We were just a little group. The president was a guy named Jim Randall, who was a doctoral student in English Lit at BU. He somehow was able to secure a commitment from Bill, Dylan Thomas to do a reading at BU in April of 1952. Uh, Dylan Thomas was living at the time, guest of an American poet scholar named John Malcolm Brennan, who lived in New York and who eventually published a book called Dylan Thomas in America, which noted the reading at BU. For about a week to 10 days, Dylan Thomas came to the Boston area, read at BU, Harvard, Tufts, and uh, MIT. A few days before the reading at BU was to take place, Jim Randall was stricken with peritonitis. His appendix almost burst. Rushed to the hospital, but was incapable, A, of picking up Dylan Thomas at the airport, B, introducing him at the reading. So as vice president, that became my job. I borrowed a car, picked him and his wife Caitlin up at the airport, drove him to host, he was then the Hotel Statler in downtown Boston, <clears throat> then picked him up, brought him to BU for the reading that evening. He drank profusely during that entire time. You mean from the time you picked him up at the airport? From the time or... he got to his hotel, right through to just before he went on stage. What was he drinking? Manhattans, out of a thermos jug. Strong. <laughs> okay. I mean, over the course of the time you were with him, did he seem more and more addled or, or drunk? Or he, he, that was just... I still have a Cadman 33 and a third disc of his reading that night. Mm -hmm. It is as clear and articulate as anything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And it was prefaced by a mini lecture called A Visit, a le a vi Lectures in America, which covered his attitude toward foreign writers, particularly British, particularly poets, coming to America and doing the circuit. Mm -hmm. It was, let us say, sarcastic. Okay, not in, not unusual for the drinking nor the sarcasm no, were considered no. unusual for. It Dylan was Thomas. amazing to me that he could hold that much liquor and read as beautifully as he did. Well, let's back it up. When was the first time you came into contact with Dylan Thomas's poetry? When I was a G, actually my junior year. I took a course called Contemporary English Literature. You're talking about your junior year in college. College. Yeah. This is 51. What, did you read much poetry in high school? Never heard of him. In high school. 
Yeah. And what, and so you started reading him in your junior year of college. In the course. And then because his poetry was so lyrical and the themes were so romantic, mm -hmm. this group, the Ride the Poetry Club, we glommed on to him. He was a favorite among our readings. Mm -hmm. And this was because of the lyricism. What else? And, 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 and the, the, uh, the very personalized view of love. It was never in the abstract. It was physical. It was uh, deeply, uh, deeply emotional. Is it visceral or? Almost, but not D. H. Lawrence kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, he, and it was, he was also pastoral. He liked to write about the countryside. Mm -hmm. And and he wrote a lot about his childhood. Obviously, you grew up in Wales. And Wales, yeah. I mean, was there any kind of, could you relate to a writer kind of writing about a time and place? And did that take you back to your own childhood? Or to, was... to some degree, because he lived right on the water. Mm -hmm. Of course, my own childhood, I grew up on the Atlantic Ocean. And I, you know. Well, just for the record, though, you, we've talked about this before, but talk just briefly about your childhood growing up in Gloucester. You worked on the fishing wharf when you were a young, old, an older boy. Yeah, I worked as a lifeguard once. Uh, I spent a great deal of time when I could at the beach. The golf club I worked at was a five-minute walk to a place called Good Harbor Beach. Uh, my folks had friends at a place called Plum Cove Beach, where I used to go frequently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you would talk about Dylan Thomas in your group, what, what common themes came up amongst the rest of the people who were reading him and why they liked him? Similar ones. Yeah. Did they all have a particular poem that you discussed that, that came up a poem lot? Poem in October was a favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Uh, and give the setting of the, the, well, the, the it, theme it, of the it's poem. Uh, it just had to do with his life in nature, really. His hmm. life in, in kind of the pastoral setting and how much he loved the, uh, the woodland and the, the, that had joined the sea. Hmm. And uh, although it was kind of a lonely tone, it showed that he really had a sense of nature that I never found, say, in Wordsworth. It wasn't as, it wasn't as emotionally intense as, because Wordsworth had written some great nature poetry mm -hmm. that I loved. Kind of tracing from picking him up at the airport and, and through the, the, the setting. The, the, well, then he did the reading. And there was a man named Edward Foote, who was a dilettante. He was the son of a very wealthy old Boston family. And he took courses in poetry at the various institutions, always as an auditor. He had nothing better to do with his life. He lived in a beautiful uh, uh, apartment complex on Beacon Hill, right on Louisburg Square. And he had a cocktail party for Dylan Thomas after the reading. So we spoke, you know, there. I can't recall. There are a lot of people there, a lot of famous people. Because Dylan Thomas, after all, was a very famous man and his very emotional relationship with his wife mm -hmm. that ran hot and cold, Caitlin, mm -hmm. was part of the show. They'd argue and fight at the, at the cocktail parties. She'd get as drunk as he did mm -hmm. and uh, sometime their dialogues were unpleasant. 
when you picked him up, was this the most famous person you'd come into contact with? Was this the the person with the most stature, or certainly in your field or academia? Oh sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. What was going through your mind when you realized you had this this kind of by happenstance by just because cheer- well, yeah, I learned it about it 48 hours before it happened. What was going through your mind knowing you were picking him up? Do you know, I just want... I anticipated the booze. Okay. Because he was famous for that. Yeah. I really didn't know, and I obviously didn't know how to address Caitlin. There was a guy that came with me, name was Don Ford. Mm-hmm. He was another grad student. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was more aggressive verbally than I was. Mm-hmm. So I can't say that I was a major participant in the car. And most of it was just banter. Were you intimidated? Very. No. Why? Because he was so articulate and because he was so unpredictable. I mean, you didn't know what he was going to say. And you didn't want to mess up in yeah, front of him? No or? obscenity or anything. But you never knew what he was going to talk about. You, and... and he was erudite for a guy that you thought of as being, you know, kind of a nature boy, kind of a Robert Burns. He was very, he was, he was very well read himself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, here I am a junior. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I didn't really uh, figure very significantly in the conversation. Mm-hmm. You were but a getaway I did, car driver. I did have to do the introduction, which was brief. I always, all my life, I've believed in introducing people, letting them get up as quickly as possible so there's no focus on me, it's on them. Mm-hmm. I can't say everybody I've ever worked with has followed that particular guideline. Mm-hmm. Anyway. And in the, in the in the the the, um, the cocktail party, everybody got. There was a lot to drink. Let me well, say. Well, I want to go back to the presentation though. What what struck you most about his? And how many people were at this reading? This is oh, about three or four hundred. So this was in filled an auditorium. And this was in again the venue. It'd be at Boston University, but which, College of Liberal Arts. But what hall was this? What what? It was just the College of Liberal Arts. Okay. And it was a, le- a large lecture hall. And he was talking about his own work. Or? First, he talked no, he well, no, hardly at all. Huh. He talked about this lectures on a visit to America, covered lots of people, mm-hmm. and lots of funny incidents, and a lot of criticisms of British superiority. Mm-hmm. That was a the- theme of his. Uh, and he said, there was a great line, see if I can remember. Those who, who exonerate the British way of life and denigrate the American way as they swig and guzzle their way through it. I love that line. Well, he read from Auden, mm-hmm. the poem that I know about uh, as I walked out one evening, which I learned by heart after hearing it. Mm-hmm. Read his own Fern Hill. He read uh, another one that I turned to be a favorite, um, Naming of Parts, by Henry Reed, which has to do with a drill sergeant teaching British trainees to work with a rifle. And what that meant philosophically to one of the kids who was being trained. Mm-hmm. It's a brilliant poem. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't remember the others. How did the crowd react to his reading? Oh, they loved it. Was it like being at a rock show for a guy like me today? Or? <sighs> They're polite. Yeah, I mean, yeah. no yelling and screaming. Yeah. And it was a very mixed group. A lot of students, but an awful lot of... They were professors from Tufts, from B.C., so a lot of Jesuits there, because mm-hmm. they loved his poetry. Uh, Harvard people, Harry Levin, a great Harvard critic, was there. Mm-hmm. There were some very well-known academic, 
a John Chiotti, mm-hmm. some people, major figures of the day. On July 29th, 1953, he was still in America. I left my home to eventually go to New York in preparation for going to Fort Benning, Georgia to begin my uh, stint in the United States Army. There was a guy who lived on Long Island and we were going to take the train together. Uh, But one night I got there, got a hotel room, uh, kind of walked around the city that day, July 30th. And I, that night I went down to a place called the White Horse Tavern, which is at the edge of Greenwich Village, was a haunt for writers of the day. And I got in there kind of late. There sitting all by himself was Dylan Thomas. And I walked over to the table introduced myself, he didn't remember me, but invited me to sit down. We talked until 3, 3.30 in the morning. Wow. He did all the talk, not all, but most. The last thing he ever said to me, he said, it's time for Phil, he had to go. Mm-hmm. Grabbed me by the arm and said, be a teacher, son, be a teacher. Why did he say that? Why do you think he said that? I don't know. Well, and then he left. Sounds like you took it to heart. Well, you could tell. <laughs> I mean, here I was. The war had been over for two days. And up until that time, I had thought of myself as going to war in Korea and maybe not coming back. Infantry. But everything changed then. And I dared to think about a future. So the next day I met this guy, this friend of mine from, from what we had been in ROTC together at BU. We went to Fort Benning. Began my life in the Army. And then, as kind of an epitaph, It was in September, I want to say the 26th. I was reading the Atlanta Journal-Constitution before we went out for our first training exercise. And I read an article in the paper that he had died, Thomas had died, of acute alcoholic poisoning of the tissues. Walked into Bellevue Hospital in New York, said, I have just drunk 18 scotches. I think that is the record. Those are the last words he ever said. Went into a coma and died. 39 years old. But I can never forget sitting there on that bunk. You know, M1 (laughs) on the bed. Right ready to go to training and reading that hit me right between the eyes and that's the last I can literally tell you about Dylan Thomas is he your favorite poet? no Auden is mm-hmm. and that's Auden. who he read yeah that Auden. poem I mean, he's written some other stuff mm-hmm. that I also like very much but um, but uh, the, and I, I also like E.A. Robinson mm-hmm. because of his the picture he draws of New England. Uh, and I like Thomas. Don't get me wrong; he's way up there. Mm-hmm. But being honest, Auden and, and Robinson are my favorites. They didn't tell you to become a teacher, though. <laughs> no, and God, the guy been. You've been drinking a lot that night. <laughs> he could have told you to pretty much go in. Could told, yeah, yeah. I, and you know, there wasn't this, because I thought about teaching before. 
It's just that until I finished with my service time, I really didn't want to think beyond that. Mm -hmm. Now, more I wanted to do the best I could in, the, in that capacity, but also I, I just thought it was it was not. I'd get through that first, and then. In fact, I applied to those graduate schools mm -hmm. while I was in the army. Mm -hmm. All right.